think what you're saying about income is so important because when it comes to understanding our financial health, so many of us rely on income as the primary measure of success. We believe that if we earn more money, we'll be able to pay off debt, save for retirement, achieve financial independence, all the things we talk about on this podcast. Mm -hmm. But if we don't ever stop to calculate our net worth, we risk not seeing the full picture of our finances. My dad has this phrase, you know, the good news is that you've come this far. The bad news is that you went the wrong way. And that's how I feel when people only look and focus on income. Welcome to the Rich and Regular Podcast presented by Success, where we explore life at the intersection of money. I'm Julian. And I'm Kirsten. And today we are talking about one of the most important financial metrics of all times. All time. <laughs> Net the worth. Goat. <laughs> the goat. I can't, well, it doesn't work with whatever. Net worth. We're talking about net worth today. And this is our last episode in our Financial Literacy Month mm-hmm. Foundation Series. And I'm excited about this one because net worth is arguably one of the most misunderstood and perhaps underappreciated metrics in the real world. Yeah. And I say the real world because it's everywhere online. You see those CNBC headlines that are kind of like, you know, 12 year old with six million dollar net worth does these three things every morning before breakfast. Or even when I Google myself or someone else, I'll see that net worth is one of the top suggested like next words after you put their name. But if I went into a room of 100 people and surveyed the room and said, hey, do you have a ballpark of where your net worth is, I bet we get like 20 to 30 hands. That's real. And I am, you know, you often have to remind me of how misunderstood it is because in my mind, I feel like it's one of the simplest calculations to make, but I am, I'm shocked every single time we ask that question, the number of people who get it wrong. And then I get an even better feel for the number of people who would have also said the same thing, but we're too afraid to even say it, which gives me an even clear idea of how misunderstood this concept is. So that's in part why we're talking about it. I'm yes. sorry. I just had to <laughs> jump in there because like, I literally had a flashback. I was like, you're right. There are a lot <laughs> of people who still get it wrong. Yeah. Well, before we jump into today's topic, I want to shout out two of the latest reviews. Thank you so much to MD0131, who wrote a glowing five-star review that says, they've been in banking for a long time and sometimes forget that others aren't familiar with the financial jargon that they spew. Spew is their word, not mine. I (laughs) did not say they are spewing, but they said that we remind them to go back to the basics. And they're also starting a charity to help women of color build generational wealth. So, yes, shout out to you, MD0131. I'm glad I did the soon. I would have thought they were a doctor. (laughs) Maybe. And then the second one, I just love the title because the title of the review is My Extremely Biased Opinion. Okay. (laughs) But this is someone you used to work with as a graduate assistant. And it's from E.R. Wells. And they said we are truly keeping oh, financial affairs. Is. Yeah. They said we're truly keeping financially affairs really real. And that we make people deep dive into how much and the rationale behind every dollar that they spend. Oh. Which, you know, sounds a little bit like bullying, but the good kind of bullying. It's I appreciate like- <laughs> that, Em. I, you were talking about who this person was and she was saying, do you know who E.R. Wells is? And I was like, I don't know who E.R. Wells is. I thought it was like a writer <laughs> or something like that. Like some, well, this is, this is their I, pen I, name. When I hear E.R. Wells, it's like an old it's very writer. distinguished. Yeah. Well, thank you. We appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Back to the topic at hand. Do you remember when you first learned about net worth or calculated? And did people ever confuse you with phrases like your network is your net worth? Like I was confused by. I do remember. So it's funny you talk about grad school because it was it was right around grad school, right? When I met E.R. Wells, right around that time. <laughs> I remember taking, uh, I was taking a finance course. It was a corporate finance course. And I, I remember being like deathly afraid of that course because I was so insecure from my undergraduate experience with finance and accounting. And I was like, I just knew I was going to do horribly in this class. But for whatever reason, like that feeling of insecurity is what drove me to like really overachieve. And I crushed like all of those classes in grad school. And so I came out of that, like getting my MBA, like having this really good understanding or at least solid academic understanding of how the business world works. And then shortly after that, when I started to connect the dots, be able to say, oh, some of these principles, many of these principles actually can be applied to your 
personal life and I started to envision myself as like this successful future business person. I was like, oh my gosh, I feel really equipped to kind of make sense of all this stuff. Long story short, I remember coming across a magazine and it was one of those classic profiles. This was before the crazy internet era of articles like you were reading before about a three-year-old and what they eat for breakfast. But it was like more of a classic article, like this family is a profile of what to do and how to manage your money. And they basically broke down their net worth in that article. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I get it now. And and I remember like the light bulb went on because had I read that article two years before, I would have felt like this is completely unrealistic. I don't even know how you get there. Who are these people? This probably isn't even real. But here I am looking at the calculation, assets, liabilities, equity. And because I'd done all that work in understanding what that looks like for a business or a corporation, it just made a lot of sense. And a lot of times, like, I mean, that message just really kind of stuck with me. So long story short, no, my corporate finance professor never said your network is your net worth. Like, <laughs> if he did, I probably would have just picked up my bags and left. I was never really exposed to that world of money, but like, I can see how people get introduced to those things and how costly that yeah, they under- take it literally. They take it literally. They literally and take they it as buying, gospel. Pun well, they start ended. buying affiliation instead of like Absolutely. actually building their network. Absolutely. And I remember seeing that. And, and even now I still see that. I see people like really doubling and tripling down on affiliation and membership and community and all those things. Like, all right, well, when do you start doubling down on actually making investments or actually doing the thing? But it's it's the whole idea of like, oh, when you have, when you're around a million people, you'll be the million in first. And it's like, all right, well, you still got to work. You still have to yeah. invest. It's not to, automatic. It doesn't just happen. You are not automatically the sum total of the five people you spend the most time with. No, it's a figure of speech. <laughs> so is. all that to say, like, I do remember the first time, but like, it's 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 been a really, really interesting road. And I'm glad I didn't have to like unlearn a lot of those other things. Yeah. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about what net worth is and how it's calculated. And then the factors that affect your net worth and some common mistakes that we've seen along the way as we've talked to a couple of people. So let's start with what is net worth. I think the easiest way to think of it is the value of everything you own minus everything you owe, Mm -hmm. right? And it's kind of thought of as the ultimate measure of your financial health because it's almost like this game of tug of war. Remember that game you used to play on like elementary full school (laughs) field day? (laughs) So on one side of the rope, you have all of your assets. These are the things that you own that have value, like your house, cars, investments, and any other possessions that you own that, again, have value. On the other side, you have all of your debts, your mortgage, car loans, student loans, credit card balances, and any other outstanding debts that you have. Calculating your net worth determines which side of the rope is heavier, and that serves as your financial North Star. Mm -hmm. And you can use pen and paper to calculate this the old school way, or you can use an app. Our favorite app is Personal Capital, which is now called Empower. They changed the name up on us. I'm still not used to it. But you basically link all of your accounts. You input your mortgage. You you know, attach it to your your debit card, all kinds of things. And it basically spits out a number for you. Yeah, it um, calculates your, it connects to your property on Zillow. It does all those calculations for you in real time. And it calculates basically your net worth. Now, it, it may sound simple, even if you were doing it on your own, whether it's in a spreadsheet or old school pen and pad, but with anything in life, like calculating it, is not always straightforward. So going back to that example of a room of 100 people, if I were to ask them which side of the rope does your income go on? This is always one of those trick questions. A lot of people say, well, yeah, obviously it's the asset side, but people really get mixed up with that, right? Net worth and income are often used interchangeably, unfortunately, but they're very different things. So there's this old phrase of saying like, um, it's like apples to oranges with the idea being that they're in the same family as fruits but they're fundamentally different. I don't even know that that's relevant here either. It's more like comparing apples to apple cider, right? Like the same core ingredient is there, but it has to be picked, processed, and mashed, and all those other things before it eventually becomes a cider. And for most people, income, I'm going to kind of stick with this here, income is that apple. It's the amount of money you earn over a period of time. It can come from multiple sources, like a paycheck or maybe you have rental property or investments or whatever it is. Net worth, on the other hand, is further down the line. So it's the value of everything that you own minus everything that you owe. So for the sake of simplicity, let's stick with the Apple as your income example. 
most people uh, have debts to pay. So you have to take slices of that apple and use it to pay those bills and manage those debts. And of course, you got to eat some of that apple because that's how you live. But you do that process over a period of time. And assuming you haven't eaten or used all of the apples to pay bills, what's left is actually your net worth. Now, if you're smart, you take the apples that you already have, you eat some and you plant the others, you plant some of it, right? This way you don't always have to keep going to work for more apples. So over time, if you nurture those little, what do they call them, seedlings, they turn (laughs) into trees and sprout more apples. And you can choose at some point to stop working for more apples because you've literally grown your own. Was Johnny Appleseed a metaphor about network? I use it all the time. (laughs) I use it all the time, but I I try not to use Johnny Appleseed. I wonder if they still teach that. Because he's kind of a scraggly looking character. Yeah. He's a sketchy looking dude. Bo's never mentioned him, so I don't know if they still teach it. I feel like there's like some weird story behind him. (laughs) So like I I try not to literally say the name because he's a scraggly looking dude. (laughs) He is a little creepy. Yeah, like he... just walk around with a bag. Yeah, dude. Like Johnny Appleseed was a little sketchy. Where'd you get the seeds, Johnny? But the point is like still there, right? So for anyone that might be lost in the metaphor, let me clarify. We shouldn't be spending all of your income. (laughs) It's basically what it boils down to. Some of it needs to go to pay bills and manage debt. Some of it should go to quality of life, obviously to sustain life. And some of it should be invested. That's where the planting of the seeds and the reference for the apples comes from so that that money can grow over time. And if you do that, eventually that money creates more money so that you don't have to keep going to work to earn more money. So when we're calculating net worth, we're basically adding up all the assets that we have that have real market value. We're deducting all of the debts or what's called liabilities against those assets. And what's left is your equity. And that equity, that number is what's called and what's known as your net worth. I think what you're saying about income is so important because when it comes to understanding our financial health, so many of us rely on income as the primary measure of success. We believe that if we earn more money, we'll be able to pay off debt, save for retirement, achieve financial independence, all the things we talk about on this podcast. Mm -hmm. But if we don't ever stop to calculate our net worth, we risk not seeing the full picture of our finances. My dad has this phrase, you know, the good news is that you've come this far. The bad news is that you went the wrong way. And that's how I feel when people only look and focus on income. Your income is a snapshot of your financial health. It only tells part of the story. Not only does it not tell you anything about how you're spending or what your debts are, it can be disrupted at any point by a job loss or a reduction in hours. Net worth, on the other hand, is a stable and reliable measure. It's a holistic and accurate view of your financial situation, and it provides a long-term perspective that you need to understand before making any other decisions. I completely agree. I think there's definitely a psychological effect here because... The, you know, that that number, that net worth number, depending on where you are or what point of your life or career you're in, that number can actually be discouraging. Whereas your income, especially if you're looking at your income relative to others or relative to where it used to be, can be much more positive. And so as a result, people like really just double down and focus on that thing. But again, it does not tell the whole picture. So I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the factors that affect net worth. And we've already covered one of them, which is income, but I want to adjust, uh, I'll go back to some of the life stages and see how that plays out a little bit. So after being in the personal finance community for what maybe five years now and really kind of obsessing about money and personal finance for going on 15 years, I've seen people really obsess over net worth, right? And it makes sense. It's a really important uh, metric to track. And so you find a lot of people, they track it daily, even weekly. I can certainly relate to that. I've been in that point or at, in that boat rather at a certain point in my life, but I do not recommend that our listeners do that or anyone for that matter. And the reason is because different life stages can really impact your net worth. So when you're starting out your career, you know, oftentimes you may have a low or a negative net worth because you're just beginning to earn money and you may have student loans to repay. You may have incurred some credit card debt. You may have a car loan or any other sort of debt obligations. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've made bad decisions. It just means that you haven't earned enough income or had enough time to invest that income or enough time for the assets that you do have to appreciate to sort of counteract the liabilities against them. 
And this is a good time to establish good financial habits, though, and make smart investments in your future earning potential, which should over time contribute positively to your net worth. So if you're just looking at this early stage and you're feeling like it's negative, you have a negative net worth and I just want to be clear that that does not necessarily mean that you've made bad decisions. I'll use another example. If you're buying a home, your net worth could really go either way. I think back to when I first bought my home in 2007. We all know what happened in 2008. The value of that property dropped by 50 percent. But I would say I was very much at the peak of like me being actively involved with my money. I was paying attention to literally every single penny. I wasn't doing anything wrong, but. Because so much of my net worth was tied up in that home and the broader environment and the neighborhood and the property and the real estate suffered, my net worth had a dramatic impact, right? I wasn't doing anything bad. I was actually still doing well at work, right? So this is what I mean by when you pay attention to that number, we're saying it's important. We're saying it's like the ultimate sort of metric, but it's not the end all be all. Now, on top of that, buying a home means for a lot of people that you're also taking on a mortgage and you're taking on the cost of ownership, which has an obvious impact on your cash flow. All of this requires cash in order for you to maintain or even acquire the property. So even that may have an impact on your net worth. So all of that to say, these are the things that you really want to pay attention to, but like you kind of want to take it with a grain of salt. I use another example. It's the last one here. Even if we weren't talking about property, if we were just talking about investing, going back to 2007, like I remember it starting, well, it was closer to like 2008, 2009. Started my job, finally got some stable income, started investing, started investing on my own. A lot of the value of those investments went down. Why? Because like it was a really weird time. It was the beginning of the Great Recession. Doesn't mean I was doing anything wrong. Right. And so if you're in that boat, I just want to make sure that we are sharing that with you, because if you panic, if you sell or if you panic and decide not to acquire appreciating assets like stocks and mutual funds and real estate and do all of those things that we know to do, because it feels like you're going to end up losing money or because you visibly see that it's having a negative impact on your net worth. If you panic and don't buy or panic and sell you're really just shooting yourself in the foot. You're going to lose out on the opportunity for all of those assets to do what we know historically they've been able to do, which is appreciate over time. And so all of that to say, you know, even if you're one of those people and you're happen to be clicking on, keep picking on CNBC, but you click on CNBC and you see the article and it says something to the effect of, oh, if you're between the ages of 35 and 49, your net worth should be here. Or this is what the average net worth is for someone. Like those things are important metrics, but they may not necessarily be relevant for you, right? Like it's important. It's right in the way that they've measured it, but like that's not your situation. And so you really want to make sure that you're taking all of those things with a grain of salt and just keep in mind that your financial situation is unique to you and really should not be compared to anyone else's. Love it. So one of the most effective ways to increase your net worth is to reduce your debt, particularly that high interest debt that comes from credit cards and personal loans, because as they accumulate interest, they decrease the amount of money that you have to do things like save and invest. We've done several podcast episodes on debt and even life after debt. Check out episode 63, where we offer five tips for managing credit card debt and offer some pointers. But we also know that the lion's share of American debt is stuff like auto loans, student loans, and mortgage. And for that kind of non-revolving debt, if you haven't already looked into debt consolidation or refinancing options, your best bet is to avoid getting into more debt. And I know that sounds like, duh, Kirsten, but look, I talk to y'all regularly. I hear the mental backflips that happen when people justify purchases that they can't afford or when they're quick to spend you know, money that they just got in a job promotion. I Mm -hmm. talked to someone a couple of weeks ago who basically asked me to convince her not to buy a car. She listens to this podcast on a regular basis. She got a huge promotion. (laughs) She knows who she is. You listening? (laughs) I mean, she got a passive aggressive. She got a huge promotion at work, one that presumably affords her the ability to get a nicer, newer car. And she needed me to tell her not to. And like I told her, don't do it. Don't do it. Does she you do it anyway? She hasn't done it yet. 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 Okay. <laughs> and I don't I'm think she's you know. going to. I don't think she's going to. But whether it's a new car because the old one is too small or a new phone because the old one is too slow, we hear it all the time. And we're hoping that this episode creates a little annoying voice in the back of your head that says, 
is this purchase moving me towards my financial goals or is it keeping me in the same place? I like that. Okay. So paying down debt, that is definitely one way to do it. If we're looking at the other side of this equation, then increasing income is another option. In fact, it's probably my favorite option. So increasing income, how do we do this? There's Listen, there's not enough time in the podcast to go into this in depth. But again, this is really all about using the income that you have, any surplus income, discretionary income to acquire or buy or purchase appreciating assets, a.k.a. investing. This can be investing in things like real estate where you decide to own a property and rent it out. You become a landlord. Congratulations. Or maybe you invest in a property with the idea of fixing it up and then selling it for a higher value. That's called flipping or it's wholesaling or any of the other derivatives that are part of real estate. But these are sustainable and proven paths to building wealth. If none of that interests you, you can also invest in the stock market. There are tons of ways to do that. You can do short term, long term. We talk a lot about that in our book. We talk a good bit about that here on this podcast, but that's another way. You can also invest in yourself, aka start a business. If it's a small business, then we're talking about taking maybe a hobby and turning that into a business, which some people call a side hustle. Whatever comfortable word for you, like this is these are all different ways that you can um grow your income, whether you're launching a product or a web-based business or deciding to finally step out and launch a podcast or a blog and you want to be a part of the creator economy. All of these things are sustainable ways and proven ways to help grow and create some more income that you can use to have a positive impact on your net worth. Now, like any other investment decision, none of this is guaranteed. Most of this is cyclical. It requires the use of one asset, basically. And most times we're talking about cash in addition to time and any other capital that you have amassed over a certain period of time. And you're basically converting that into this new asset class or your business or whatever it is. But if done well, the value of that will multiply significantly more than it would have if you had just left it in cash. And all of that has a positive impact on your net worth. All right. Now that we have sold you on calculating your net worth, let's talk about some watch outs. So one of the most common mistakes that I see is not considering all of your liabilities. People forget to include the loan that they're paying back on their 401k Mm -hmm. or the $5,000 that they owe their mom because it just gets transferred and it's a, you know, it's a handshake deal. You want to make sure that you're counting everything that you owe. If you have a HELOC, a home equity line of credit, you need to consider the outstanding balance on that HELOC, the money that you owe as a liability that needs to be subtracted from the value of your home. Same goes for tax payment plans, credit cards, medical repayments, anything that you have negotiated that you owe needs to be counted. Everything. Now, if you don't trust your memory, this is where software helps. If you're willing to share your bank statements and other financial information, an app can help you categorize it, identify what looks like recurring payments, and ask you, is this debt? So that you can then mark it on the liability side. Yeah. And sort of flipping that on the other side, you also want to make sure that you're not overstating the value of your assets. We talked about life insurance last week. The value of your policy or anyone else's policy, assuming you're the beneficiary, does not go into that asset column. You can be mindful of it. It's certainly something that you want to incorporate into any of your long-term projections, but it should not be a part of your net worth calculation because it will distort your financial health. I've seen people just put the Kelly Blue Book value of their car in the asset column without realizing that one, this is a depreciating asset, and two, the demand for that model can change at any point. Now, right. even as I say that, we are living in a really weird alternate universe where the value of used cars is actually going up. Well, actually, it's slowed don't down know now. If that's still yeah, the case. no, it stopped doing that like the end of last year. Yeah, but there was a weird moment where yeah. that was the case. <laughs> but the point is, if you think about the gas guzzlers of yesteryear, you know, right. you can... The old Hummers. Yeah, Hummers, <laughs> like literally, like the epitome of gas guzzler. You start to realize like some of these cars really go down in value and that can be dramatic. Now, the what you owe on it does not care. Right. Like it is irrespective of what you owe uh, on that car. So if the value of that car goes down because it's not on music videos anymore, it doesn't matter. You still owe a hundred thousand dollars on that car. We talked about collectibles, but we can also talk about things like jewelry and antiques. These are all things that kind of fall in the same boat, because what you find is that a lot of people have 
emotional attachments to these things. Uh, and as a result, it distorts what they believe the value is, why you and your family may value and believe that there's an incredible story behind grandma's china cabinet. The reality is there may not be a market for it, right? It might be worthless in some cases, and it can be unfortunate to feel that way, but that is the reality of the world that we live in. So it's not to say that you can't put this stuff in your asset column at all, but if those kinds of items account for more than, let's say, 5 to 10% of your total net worth, you really want to ensure that you're regularly updating your calculations, maybe pressure testing the market on a more regular basis to ensure that it is worth what you are seeing it is worth. It's not really up to you as the holder of that item. It's really dependent on what the buyer or what the market has to say about it. And the benefits of that are twofold. One, it informs you of when to sell something because over time you can start to see that, hey, I think we may have actually hit our peak. And so you might want to go ahead and sell so that you can get as much out of that item as possible. And two, it allows you to compare your assets to one another, which can also perform your other financial decisions. You may look at your net worth and decide that it's time to aggressively pay down the mortgage or that now it's not a really good time to do that and that it makes more sense to ramp up your retirement contributions. Depending on the situation, you might even realize that you need to start paying attention to the different categories of assets. So there might be uh, some cash or cash equivalents. You might have fixed income assets, things like bonds or CDs. You might have what are called real assets, which is basically like real estate and tangible goods. Like you might literally have someone who gifted you a press, a printing press or a piece of equipment, something that can be sold, or it might be equities, shares of stock, like you may have in an investment portfolio, or shares of ownership in a profitable business. That's for the more complicated people, uh, people who have businesses and all those things going on. You'll know when you're there because certain things will just dictate that you look at your money a little differently. But all of that to say, you really want to make sure that your emotions aren't getting too wrapped up into some of these assets where you have an emotional connection to it, because oftentimes that leads to you overstating their value, which has a negative long-term impact on your net worth. Yes. And I think that's closely related to this next mistake that I see, which is focusing too much on short-term gains. And it kind of goes hand in hand with tracking too frequently. And I will say this at the risk of talking out of both sides of my mouth, but this is actually the downside of using technology to track because it's so easy to just log in and see what happened and you might feel compelled to react. So Let me just say this. Net worth is a moving target. It is always fluctuating and it's not supposed to be managed impulsively. Impulsive decisions that are made to try to squeeze more out of a short term gain or stop the bleeding on a short term loss can be more harmful than just zooming out and taking this long term perspective. You kind of need to use the same discipline and mindset that you are hopefully using to approach your scale at home. On any given day, you know that your weight is going to be different in the morning when you first wake up versus the evening after a full day of eating. That's just what it is. So with our nutrition, what do we do? We focus on habits. We eat healthy. We drink water. We try to move our bodies. And the same is true for net worth. If you want to see it grow and thrive, you should be focusing on healthy financial habits like spending less than you earn and investing in regular intervals over time. I love it. All right. Was that your final thought? It should be, but I actually have another one. Okay, let's go with it. (laughs) So my final thought is that there will never be some magical sign that comes from the heavens when you've achieved the right, quote unquote, net worth. But if you focus on taking small, manageable steps towards improving your financial situation, you keep the momentum going in the right direction. It's fine to have a goal, but don't fixate on it because mistakes happen and setbacks are a normal part of the process. It may take some time, but every step that you take towards improving your net worth is a step in the right direction. I like that. Amen. You know what? Can I I get an amen? Amen. Put some in the collection basket. No, (laughs) no, I'll I'll, I'll send it to you. (laughs) My final thought is very similar, right? Like measuring your net worth is simple, but I think managing your net worth is complex. It can be really, really complicated. You have the value of your assets going up and down. You have, you know, we didn't get too much into this, but the portion of your net worth that might be in one asset class versus another. And that might shift over time, which basically means that you may feel like, oh my gosh, so much of my net worth is tied up into this one thing or these two things. That can be scary. All of that to say it is complicated, but to your point, it's personal. And so long as you're making healthy habits or, you know, 
decisions that lead to positive net worth growth that align with your values and are proven to be contributors to positive net worth growth, I think I think you're doing the right thing. And so don't overcomplicate it. But even that, I'm hedging a little bit because I'm like, you know, there are those people out there who are business owners and they may have things like intellectual property and all of these other intangible assets. I think you'll know when it's time to get complicated. But for the vast majority of people, like when you hear some of those other things that people are talking about, that's when you get caught up in that comparison trap. And it really makes this even more confusing than it can already be. So that's what net worth is. Focus on keeping it simple. And I think you will end up in a good position. All right. Well, thank you for listening to another episode of the Rich and Regular podcast presented by Success. If you like what you heard and want to make a positive impact on this podcast network, you can head over and leave us a five star rating and review on the Apple rating and review page. We will see you next week. Mm-hmm.